thank you everybody so much for joining us um uh for this uh morning and afternoon of sessions with some amazing speakers in the morning um and then some breakouts in the afternoon but i'll I'll get into um, the structure in a second. First, maybe just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you can, uh, all of this is being uh, recorded and live streamed um, on YouTube. Uh, so feel free to have cameras on or off, whatever you prefer, um, and try and stay muted when you're not talking, which it looks like most people have done. We're all very well behaved here. This is fantastic. Um, we also have a live transcript available. Uh, you can click the show captions button um, on your in your Zoom window. Um, if you're on an iOS or an Android device, it'll be under the more uh, menu, dot, 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 more menu. Um, if you're currently seeing just me as well um, and you want to switch to gallery view to see everybody, you can do that with the view menu in the top right on a computer or the little grid on, a, on an iPad. Or if you're on a phone, it will be uh, if you swipe on the video, I think, to be able to see all people. That's a, a really well hidden trick um, in the mobile version of Zoom. So now you know that. There you go. If you learn one thing today, it's how to reveal the, all the speakers in Zoom on a phone. Um, and I should also say thank you very much to Code for All, who've um, helped us spread the word about today's event. Um, my society is a Code for All member. Um, and we're currently in the middle of Code for All's 2022 summit, uh, and there are all sorts of interesting talks that have already happened and have been um, shared on Code for All's YouTube channel, and some more that are going to be happening uh, throughout today and tomorrow. Um, uh, so visit, I think, codeforall.org to see the full um, schedule and what's happening later and what you might have missed earlier this week that you can catch up on. All sorts of things, not only from climate, but also um transparency and democracy topics um from all over the world so uh thank you very much to everybody as well who's joining us via the code for all network um and coming along to this event it's great to have you here um as for uh, getting the word out feel free to um share whatever you like from this event um on social media uh we're at my society on twitter in particular and we'll uh, retweet anything that we see popping up um, and if you've got any questions um, or comments for the Q&A section, um, after all of our speakers will present um, their what they've got to say for about 10 minutes each, and then after that we've got a like, um, fair amount of time for questions, so pop those in the chat, um, and my lovely colleagues will make sure that we uh, try and get through as many of those questions as possible uh, in the Q&A before lunch. Um, I think that's probably everything. A quick introduction to what this event is actually about, now you're here. Um, My Society's climate programme is all about supporting a local response to the climate emergency. And we think to make real progress here, we need to bring together citizens and local authorities or councils and community groups and technologists and researchers and journalists and all sorts of people active in this space with different interests and different ideas as to how to drive wider participation and better climate solutions. Um, and today, as part of this event, we're going to hear from innovators and local council representatives in the UK and beyond um, and you'll learn about new technologies and methods that are helping this transition to carbon zero at the local level. Um, and maybe you might also find um, a few projects to trial in your council area, because um, as we mentioned in some of the comms before this event, we've got um, a couple of £5,000 grants that we're hoping to give out to um, groups, including a, a local council, who want to try something out and experiment. My Society's climate programme is fairly experimental ourselves, and we'd like to encourage uh, that um, with £5,000, which possibly isn't a massive amount of money, but um, might be enough for you to try something that you wouldn't normally be able to get off the ground. Um, so Keep an eye out for the things our speakers are going to be sharing over the next hour or so and for discussions later on in the breakouts. And maybe there might be something there that you or an organisation you know um, or someone else in one of the groups might want to work on with you um, with those £5,000 grants. 
Um, and all of this is is the beginning of a, a, pro um, um, a process. So we're going to be having uh, some catch ups later on in October um, for people who are interested in taking those grants forward um, and finding out how my society and our partners could help support that through technology or research or data or whatever expertise we can lend to give them a, a helping hand. And the structure for today, um, as I mentioned, is that we're starting off with some inspiration from our inspirational speakers um, who are joining us from across the world. Um, more about who they are in a second. Uh, then we're going to be going into a Q&A for about half an hour. Um, so as I say, pop your questions in the chat if you've got any um, as those talks are going on. Then we're going to have a nice long lunch break. We are fans of a long lunch break um, at my society. Get outside if the weather's good enough. I, I saw there was lots of chat about drizzle and not very nice weather, so maybe that might not work. But um, uh, after lunch, um, about two o'clock, we'll be starting off in a different Zoom room, I think. Rachel confirmed that. I, I think it is. Um, and we'll be having a couple of breakout sessions. So there's going to be four breakouts and you can choose um, uh, a total of two of those because there's two happening at, at a time. So um, one will be on adaptation mostly and one on engagement. And then later on in the afternoon, one on sort of spatial planning and um, like community planning and then one on uh, equity, diversity and inclusion um, or climate justice. Uh, and we're going to have a short break between those as well, so you can uh, um, stretch your legs and, uh, and get refreshments between the two breakouts. And then we'll wrap up at a, hopefully wrapping up for four o'clock is the plan, UK time. Yes, there's a, a different link in your emails. Thank you, Rachel, for the second half. We'll help you out with all of that before we break for lunch. I think that's probably everything and we're running slightly ahead of schedule, but I think that's probably a good thing because it will give us more time for um, for questions after. So um, maybe we should uh, kick off. I'll just explain who our speakers are um, and this is the order they'll be they'll be speaking in. Um, first off, we've got uh, Annie Pickering, who's co-director at Climate Emergency UK, who are one of our partners at my society. Um, and she'll be discussing their scorecards project and how councils can improve their score. After Annie, we're going to have Ariane Crampton, um, head of Wiltshire Council's climate programme, and we'll be discussing uh, how the council engaged with rural communities in particular um, as part of the equity, diversity and inclusion strand of their climate action plan. We've got Klaus Wilhelmsen, from, he's an environmental planner at Copenhagen City Council's climate division and he'll be sharing insights from the implementation of their plan, uh, which includes some really cool stuff about spatial planning. Uh, we've got Ornaldo, and I'm going to mispronounce your last name. I should have checked this in the green room. Uh, Ornaldo Giorgi? Giorgi is fine. Giorgi. Um, thank you very much. Um, a data journalist at the European Data Journalism Network, and he'll be looking at local climate data across Europe. Um, and Casper Spahn, um, policy developer at Waternet, which is Amsterdam's water company. And he'll be discussing how the Resilio project there is adapting the city's roofs for a changing climate, um, amongst other things. So each of those will have about 10 minutes each uh, with a good opportunity for questions after. So questions in the, in the chat. Um, and I think that's probably everything we need to cover before we hand over to Annie. I will get your slides up, Annie. Um, cool. Here we Thank go. You. Great. I'm going to minimise you guys so I can actually see my notes. So yeah, as Serena said, I'm one of the co-directors at Climate Emergency UK and in the UK, um, last year and then we published in January, we measured and assessed all UK Council climate action plans and gave them a score um, on how good we thought they were based on uh, various different metrics. And then next year, we're in the process of working out how to measure actual council climate action um, and doing a similar scorecard process. Um, so I'm going to really quickly explain how we did cli council climate plan scorecards. Some of the things we learned 
Um, and then it'll let you a little bit know about our thinking so far for the action scorecards. And I think it's worth saying this is like the first time that this has happened in the UK. No one else is measuring council climate action at the moment. And it is definitely something that could be replicated in other countries or in other sectors. So I kind of want you to bear that in mind as a kind of, yeah, frame to be looking at this work through. So I think if you go to the next slide, here we go. So quickly, yeah, who are we? Um, Climate Emergency UK was founded back in yeah, 2018, 2019 by Kevin. Um, and we started simply by just collecting the climate emergency declarations for councils because so, we didn't want them to like have to be reinvented the wheel each time. And then we realised it's also useful to like know if they've got an actual council climate action plan and what that is. Then we worked um, to work out Okay, it's all very well and good to have a climate action plan, but like, what is a good one? You know, is it a two page document? Is it 50 pages? Like, what is the content? Um, you know, the quality of it is really important. And then we worked with my society to create, it's now called Kate, the Climate Action Plan Explorer database where we were logging um, Council's climate action plans and additional information. And then that developed into the, like, okay, we want to measure actually how good these plans are and in future years the actual action. Um, so we've yeah moved on quite a bit um, since we started a few years ago. Next slide. So yeah, really quickly, what are these scorecards? Um, so I think it will say it on the next slide. Yeah. Uh, so I've kind of covered it briefly, um, but we realised, especially around 2019, 2020, like pre-pandemic, there was a massive wave of council climate action. Councils were declaring climate emergencies, especially in the UK. And it was like becoming a thing that councils were taking a little bit more seriously. There was also the Climate Change Committee's Local Authority and Six Carbon Budget Report, nice and catchy, um, which stated that local authorities have the influence and power to influence up to 30% of local emissions within an area, carbon emissions. So whilst there is a lot that national government could be doing, it's often slow and hard to get change from there. So we wanted to focus on where we can make change happen at a council level and I'm sure you know, especially if you're from councils you know that there are some really good examples of some councils doing really good things in some areas but it's hard to know what's happening across the whole of the UK or indeed like the wider world so we wanted a way to be benchmarking and assessing that work and sharing that knowledge so that both campaigners and councillors could learn from each other and improve um, so using the checklist that we previously created with Ashton and other organisations um, that was like what we think should be in a good climate action plan. We created a set of 29 questions to measure councils against um, to say that like, this is what should be a good climate action plan. So it was about both highlighting the work that councils had done and showing you know where they are succeeding but also showing where councils are not doing what perhaps their neighbouring council is doing or what other councils are doing and kind of showing that picture um, to understand you know where improvements could be made. I think to the next slide. We might not have one. Yeah, so this is what we created. Um, that's the website. Um, there's way more details than that, but that's just to give you an idea of what it looks like. And just to cover a little bit more about um, how we created it, we did if you, yeah, we'll go with that, James. I don't mind where you say. Um, we did a three-stage marking process. So we had a team of trained volunteers to mark all council's climate action plans. So we were only looking at publicly available information, and that's something we will primarily continue next year. Um, because the other kind of part of this project is, yeah, we want councils and campaigners to be doing more for climate action, want to support them to do that. But we also think it's really important that this information is transparent and clear for residents and citizens to know about their councils, um, because they're much more likely to act if that information is clear and accessible and understandable. So we use volunteers to do, um, to do the first mark based on publicly available information. Councils then got a right of reply, so they got just to see their initial mark um, because we might have like missed out a document or not read something properly or in the rare cases, councils responded saying, oh, you've given us a point, but actually we haven't done that. Um, so it was a way to kind of yeah, sense check our work. And then there was a third stage mark with another much smaller team to compare the first mark and the right of reply and give it the final score. Um, Go to the 
the next slide. I think I've covered this. Um, I guess the only thing I haven't covered um, is once we'd published the scorecards, like this is the first time there's been that UK wide picture of where council climate action, planned council climate action is. So it's a really useful tool to be used to push for further support and resources um, and legislation at a national level um, because you're able to see the, the variety and also there was yeah a few interesting things around you know what's happening in Scotland does the picture look different maybe it does because the devolved government have got different powers or are doing different things and um, so we published in January this year uh, yeah and these are some of the headline things that we found um, I'm not going to go into details and you can look at our scorecard and use the filter buttons to kind of work out your own analysis. But the headlines were that, yeah, highest scoring councils were across the political divide. Um, so that's an example of Somerset, Western Taunton, Manchester and Solihill, both Lib Dem, Labour, Conservative and kind of spread around the country as well. Um, within district councils, so we had five lists um, representing councils with different powers, and within the district council list, five, four of the top five were ones that were coalitional minority-run councils, bearing in mind this is from January 2022, and I know there has been local elections in some places, and it may have changed, um, but I think there's like interesting comments around there about, you know, if you're more collaborative, does that lead to better climate action, perhaps? Um, and kind of a third point that uh, encourages that as well is there were some county councils, so they're kind of like bigger councils that are above local district councils, who had done a joint plan with the other district councils. And where that had happened, those counties and districts had scored higher. Um, so we go to the next slide. This leads me nicely on to like, how can you improve your council climate action plan? Um, so from marking 409 local authority council climate action plans um, we found out quite a lot um, and these were kind of like the top 10 i don't want to say easy but like uh universal things that can be done to improve council climate action plans there are nine boxes there's 10 in the title that's because uh two of the actions i've merged on work together um so i guess the example i just showed before about county councils working together that showed to like create better council climate action plans and we hope better council climate action and whilst it's important to work with local councils you know as neighbours there's also businesses schools and other institutions in the area that we think it's really important that councils can work with especially given they have limited resources um, the one that I think a lot of councils are picking up on and rewriting their plans around is making sure actions have smart targets so like the climate crisis is huge and you know, councils need to take serious action. But equally, if they say we're going to decarbonise by 2030 and just have some kind of waffly lines about we're going to decarbonise transport and we're going to improve recycling, it's really hard to know like how you're going to do that. Is there achievable and who's going to do it? So we're really encouraging councils to have smart targets to be specific about what actually do they have influence and control over, how are they going to do it, with what resources, and how are they going to measure that success? And actually, a realistic target is way better than kind of nice sounding words that don't necessarily lead to the action. Um, a few other ones I'll pick up on um, is we really want councils to be sure they're working out who is the most vulnerable in the area, kind of from the impacts of climate change and how they're prioritising them in their work. It's also about embedding climate action across the council, so not just, you know, in the sustainability department or in the waste management system. So that's where we think councils receive councillors and staff receiving carbon literacy training is really important having named staff members to oversee the plan and also linking your council climate action to your other plans. So what is it saying in your corporate plan or in your local plan around climate action? Because what happens in those plans can also have an influence and you don't want them to be conflicting. Um, all of this is on our website and there's a much more detailed document about um, how to improve your council climate action plan. So do take a look at that if you're interested. Moving on to the next slide. So I think I've seen bits in the chat box about next year's scorecards and I haven't been able to respond, but hopefully this might cover it a little bit. So like I said, as much as plans are important, because we kind of think, you know, maybe you haven't planned out your work, there's no commitment to do it. 
what we really want to be looking at is council climate action. So we spent this year working out what those metrics could be. Um, and the aim of the work is similar to last year in that we want to we want these results to be used both by councils and campaigners to improve and change their climate action in order um, to reach net zero as far as possible within the current constraints. Like we recognize that council's power is limited to some extent, but what our plan scorecards and our research so far for the action scorecards has shown is there is a lot that councils can be doing within the current constraints and some are kind of reaching that threshold and doing all of it and some aren't and there might be like two or three quite decent actions that councils could be doing to make a real difference to emissions um, so we want to see emissions being reduced through the work of councils and we also recognize that often campaigners play a key role in encouraging those councils to take action um, but they're in a similar situation with uh, councillors it's hard to know like the picture and what actually to be asking councils to do because especially in the UK local government is confusing and complex and different everywhere um, so this is trying to provide that overall picture and that understanding for how they can campaign for that change you move on to the next slide so this is just a lit little teaser of some of the things we may well be scoring in the scorecards um, we're going to do the same three stage marking process um, as I covered before and as far as possible we're going to be um, using publicly available information, although we will also be using a very small number of freedom of inf information requests. And we're also going to be using some national data so like um, recycling uh, is uh, yeah, national data um, so just. I'm not going to read through all of these because the questions aren't here, but this is just an idea of the main sections we want to be looking at, such as buildings and heating, both of council owned buildings and in the wider area, governance in terms of how the council is running in order to embed climate action uh, and transport both within their control and the wider area. The next slide, which I think is the last slide. Yeah, so I'm wrapping up there um, and obviously yeah, there'll be questions later, but do uh, sign up to our newsletter to find out more, especially if you're in the UK. You can also donate. Uh, we're an incredibly small charity. And if there's people here are interested in getting involved, we're actually doing some trial volunteer marking next month on our draft scorecards. So if you're interested in helping out with that, I'll pop the link in the chat. Um, so I think I'll wrap up there. And yeah, it looks like there might be some interesting questions later on. Yeah, definitely a couple of questions in the chat for you uh, later on. That's brilliant. Amazing. And well done for actually managing to cram all of that into, into a, just over 10 minutes. <laughs> There's a, a lot of work there to cover. Um, and it's a really good example of using whatever data is available and crowdsourcing and collecting lots of that data um, to try and uh, give everybody a better idea of what actions actually planned and coming up, what actions actually going to um, has actually taken place, which is really good. Thank you very much. Um, we've got next up uh, Ariane Crampton from Wiltshire County Council. I will just get your slides up, Ariane. Bear with me one second. Uh, there we Morning. go. Thank you. Off you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so good morning everyone, uh, I'm Ariane Crampton, I'm the Head of Climate Programme at Wiltshire Council. Um, so for those of you who don't know where Wiltshire is, it's a rural authority in the southwest of England and it's the home of Stonehenge, which is why we've got that lovely picture on the front cover of our climate strategy. Um, and for those who know about the local government system in the UK, it's a county-wide unitary authority, so it's no longer a county council, um, five councils merged into one back in 2009. Next slide, please. So this is what I'm going to cover this morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about our strategy development and how we engaged widely for that. Um, and then I'm going to touch on a couple of examples of diversity and inclusion in delivery. Next slide, please. Uh, so starting with the development of our climate strategy, um, we this dates back to 2019. So like a lot of other councils, we acknowledged a climate emergency in Wiltshire back in 2019, and we committed to seek to make the whole of Wiltshire carbon neutral by 2030. Obviously a very challenging ambition. 
Um, we also then later that year set a target to become carbon neutral as an organisation by 2030. And the climate team, including myself, was appointed then uh, in June 2020. And the first thing we did was produce a discussion document setting out the key issues around the climate agenda for Wiltshire. So using all the data um, that was available at that point and presenting it and presenting what we thought the key challenges were and where the council could take action. And then we use the feedback from that targeted consultation to develop a draft climate strategy, which we then consulted on widely. Next slide, please. Um, so our approach was to keep things really, really simple because we wanted to encourage a really wide readership. And um, we recognise that actually you can end up with uh, alienating people if you have documents that are too long and too technical. Um, so we use a lot of Im images, a lot of infographics, um, and then committed to delivering some, uh, developing some delivery plans with the detail, which is what we have since done. Um, obviously, as local authorities uh, have influence over a third of emissions in their area, we have focused on that. But we also recognise that we need that public engagement and buy in from other partners to tackle the other two thirds. So that is a really strong element of our strategy. Um, and in terms of the five key principles in our strategy, be inclusive there, you can see is listed as the first one. So it's really about ensuring that the transition to a low carbon res cl climate resilient future is accessible to all sectors of society, including our rural communities and businesses. So next slide, please. In terms of how we engaged, um, we had the challenge of trying to consult on this document when COVID was making face-to-face -face interactions uh, quite difficult. So um, we focused uh, with online on online webinars as, as a main method of uh, face of engagement um, and interaction and an online survey. But we recognise that there are many uh, digitally excluded groups. And so for those groups, we provided face to face events in libraries. We also went out to schools and ran some sessions in schools and also talked to disability groups face to face. We did extensive communications through social media and through tradi traditional press releases. And then we um, issued these posters that you can see on the right hand side, so really hard hitting posters climate change affects us all is the key message there. Um, and we sent those out to all our libraries, our leisure centres, and then every single parish council received one to put on their notice board. And we've got 250 parish councils in Wiltshire. So that was a lot of people who got a poster. Um, we then uh, also uh, delivered presentations at meetings with public and private sector partners to make sure that they were aware of our strategy. And we produced an easy read summary of the draft document, which is something I don't believe many other councils have done, if any. So if you're not familiar with the easy read format, um, next slide, please. This is what it looks like. So it's basically picking out our key themes and then a very few uh, simplified um, pictures and descriptions of what we're going to do. Um, and in particular, the one thing you can do. So for every theme within our strategy, we had uh, one thing you can do to, again, get that engagement from individuals reading the document about what how they can play their part and what they can do. So um, that easy read version was you know, designed to be accessible to people who may not otherwise engage with such a technical document. Next slide, please. Um, so the engagement results were quite encouraging. We had 181 people attending the webinars. We had 300 replay views and we received over 100 written responses. We launched a social media campaign at the same time as our climate strategy consultation with hashtag Wilts can do this. Um, and we themed some posts around the seven themes of our strategy and they were seen by over a million individuals. Um, we had uh, more than 8,800 8, unique views on our online climate and strategy consultation content, which is a lot more than um, we normally get on council web pages. It's kind of on a par with the number of web views we get for our very popular pages, which are around bin collections uh, and the kind of things that everybody wants to know about all the time. Um, we, in total, we got more than a thousand survey responses, which compares really, really favourably with other consultation efforts by the council. 
Um, and that includes the, the majority of those were online, but we also had some uh, paper surveys completed by schools. Um, and we also generated more than 100 questions through the webinars and published a QA and a um, to ensure complete transparency and make sure that everybody could access that information. Next slide, please. So um, what, what did the responses actually look like uh, in terms of who completed the survey? Um, we were concerned that we would only reach uh, the usual people who engage with this kind of thing. And that's why we really put a lot of effort into a wide reach. And actually these res results show that we did reach um, more than uh, the white middle-class people in Wiltshire. Um, so you can see there, the those who responded to the income bra bracket question, there was a wide range from very low incomes to high incomes. Um, and then in terms of ethnicity, we only have a very small black or minority ethnic population in Wiltshire, but um, the respondents actually, profile of the respondents actually matched the county profile. You can see there in green is um, the, uh, Blue is the Wiltshire population and green is the survey responses. The label seems to have fallen off my slides, so sorry about that. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then we also looked at the age profile because we do have an older population here in Wiltshire and they tend to be a lot more vocal. So we had put a lot of effort into reaching people of working age and younger people through schools. And you can see here again that blue shows the Wiltshire population and green the survey responses. Um, I mean, there is a slight overrepresentation, as you can see in the older age brackets and underrepresentation in the younger age brackets. But if we hadn't done the sessions in schools for under 18s, it would have been a lot more imbalanced. So that was definitely worth doing. Next slide, please. And then the other thing we were really keen to do was uh, get a response from people who were not already involved in a local environmental group. Um, and you can see here that actually only a third of those responding were a member of a local environmental group. So the majority of those responding were not already engaged and we're reaching people who are not already, um, you know, talking to us about this agenda, which is great. And even of those who are members of local environmental groups, a lot of them were wildlife trust members. So again, they're not people who would normally engage with the council on this. Um, we promoted the survey through the Wildlife Trust and they supported us with that. So it's not really surprising. We've got a lot of uh, Wildlife Trust members responding, responding, but we were pleased with this, um, this balance of responses. Next slide, please. And then in terms of uh, what people were telling us, um, they were actually telling us that they support our objectives. Uh, which is great. And there were some very clear messages about what people want the council to do more of, and also an appetite for the council to do more to embed climate objectives across everything we do. Um, the, we were able to improve uh, our strategy uh, from and, and get buy-in from even the most critical groups as a result of this engagement process. Um, so while some of the climate activist groups uh, are very, very critical of anything we do, actually they were they, they were really supportive of our strategy and welcomed it um, when it was finally adopted, which was brilliant. Um, and we received an excellent rating in the climate emergency scorecards, which Annie has just uh, talked about. So we got the fifth best score in the UK and the top score for a rural unitary authority and, and a, a top score by a long way. So we got 85% overall, which was well above the 50% average of other unitaries. Um, and we also received top marks for community engagement and communications, which I'm guessing is why I've been invited to speak today. Um, so moving on then to um, the delivery side of things, uh, there's a couple of schemes that we're doing which are really focused on inclusion that I wanted to highlight. Um, the first one is Warm and Safe Wiltshire. So this is a free advice line and home visits for people in fuel poverty. It's been running for a number of years. Um, and just in the first quarter of this year, uh, we supported 654 households with this service. Um, it's uh, managed by our public health team. So it has really strong links into the NHS in particular. And we get referrals from across the NHS, but particularly after hospital discharges, for example, to make sure that people are not going back into a cold home after they leave hospital. Um, and then uh, we've also focused really strongly on supporting our council tenants and making sure that they 
uh, haven't got energy bills that they can't afford. So we're going to be retrofitting all 5,000 council homes in Wiltshire by 2030, spending £50 million to get them all up to an EPCB rating. Um, we started that work, so we've done retrofit assessments for the first 800 properties, and we're, we've retrofitted 90 homes to date. Um, and there's a whole load of different measures that, that we've put in there uh, to help our tenants. And then we're also, uh, we've also got an ambitious um, council home building programme. So we're building a thousand new zero carbon council homes. And we've got the first 19 due to be completed by April 2023. Um, and that's very exciting using modern methods of construction. Next slide, please. And then finally, I just wanted to talk about engaging and empowering others to act, which I think follows on really well from Annie's point about collaboration. Um, so we have focused a lot on working with town and parish councils and two uh, successful initiatives that we've done with them are a climate action planning day, um, which we funded and we had over 30 parish parish councils represented at that, at that session, um, where they had a whole day to really understand what climate change means for them, what action they can take, how they can work with Wiltshire Council, how they can work together, um, and that worked really well. And then last week, we did a webinar for them on uh, electric vehicle charge points. Um, the council has set up a grant scheme for town and parish councils who want to put in charge points in their local area. Um, and so we had a session to explain to them what government uh, grants are available, how the council grant uh, will help to top up that government grant, um, how they can access it, um, you know, which supplies they can use. We've opened up our contract to our supplier to them if they want to piggyback on the council's contract. So that again, that was really well received. We had more than 80 people registering uh, to attend that webinar, which was phenomenal. Um, We've also got uh, a public sector partners working group, which is under our public service board, where we share good practice and collaborate um, and help each other out. Um, and then we set up a new working group with other social landlords uh, who operate in Wiltshire, um, because the council has 5,000 council homes, but the majority of social housing in Wiltshire is operated by registered providers. Um, and so it's really important that we work together and we are leading the way with our large scale retrofit program. So we want to share that knowledge with the other social landlords um, and we meet regularly to do that. Um, we also work with our local environmental groups. So they've um, set up webinars on different topics and invited the council along to present and to explain what we're doing. So we do that. Um, and then finally, our newest initiative is a new climate and environment forum. Um, that's brand new. We've got our first formal meeting next week. Um, and that's a new reference group, which we've recruited from a cross section of Wiltshire residents. There's about 30 people on the forum and we're looking really for a range of views on what we're doing in terms of our environmental initiatives um, and uh, getting a sense of how they're received, whether people know about them, what more we need to do about communicating them, etc. So that's a very quick uh, roundup of the um, what Wilch is doing and I'll be very happy to answer any questions later. Thank you. Amazing, thank you very much Ariane. Some really nice practical examples of community engagement as well by a council, really nice to see. Um, I will quickly move us on uh, to Klaus joining us from Copenhagen. Um, thank you very much, um, bringing us an international perspective um go well, ahead and, uh, and share your slides and take off <laughs> thanks a lot i'll see if i can do it in 10 minutes i have a lot of inspiration <laughs> but please get back get back to me if you yeah if you want to have some uh, unfolding of uh, some of them but uh yeah thanks for the invitation uh i can say that the the reason for why we're doing this is uh, like you the climate uh, emergency we need uh, drastic uh, emission cuts uh the longer we wait the more uh, drastic it has to be uh so luckily we have been uh we've been doing this uh, for a number of years in copenhagen uh and i will give you some inspiration uh mainly uh, around uh, physical planning and, and and focus on some cases uh, in in construction and civil works uh, projects that I have been mostly engaged with. Um, the context about Copenhagen is that we are around 650,000 inhabitants. We have uh, been growing 100,000 
during the last 10, 12 years, I think. Uh, and, and, uh, and besides this, we have been able to make some drastic emission cuts, I would uh, say. Um, here you can see our soil deposit uh, in the background where we receive a lot of uh, soil clean and contaminated. And this is a, 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 a way to, to expand the city actually to, to receive 40,000 new inhabitants also. Um, while receiving uh, them, we also uh, need to, 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 to get it done uh, more emission fossil and more emission free than we are doing now. Uh, the main strategic uh, plan for this have, have uh, been our climate plan that we uh, agreed to in, in 2009, um, where we had the COP15 in Copenhagen. Also, we have seven mayors in Copenhagen, uh, one mayor for each of the seven administrations. Um, and they all agreed uh, to this uh, climate plan uh, to make us CO2 neutral before 2025. 20, uh, we have uh, now uh, sort of admitted that we cannot reach this target because uh, the state could not lend us the money to, to have a uh, carbon capture and storage uh, facility uh, in our garbage uh, uh, facility. Um, so we uh, will reach it maybe in 2026, 2027. But uh, we have uh, reached a 70% reduction compared to 1990. Uh, so that's a major step of the way, I would say. Uh, from the beginning, we have uh, said that, okay, this cannot happen uh, without cooperation uh, between uh, business, research, and citizens. So they have been a, a substantial part of the, of the transition. We, uh, we work in, in roadmaps in Copenhagen, and we are uh, in the third and last uh, roadmap for the moment where we have uh, 47 initiatives uh, across four pillars that you will see in Shogwa, uh, where we uh, try to, 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 uh, to reach the neutrality goal. Um, uh, the four pillars you can see here, uh, they are uh, in, in energy consumption, production, mobility, and, and city administration, uh, which is sort of to sweep in front of our own doorstep. Uh, the, the things highlighted in, in, in yellow are some of the things that I'll be uh, talking to you about, namely buildings and uh, non road machinery and vehicles in general. Uh, since 1998, we have had uh, what we call sustainability in construction and sewer works, which is a, a list of uh, demands that we uh, set towards our own uh, buildings and, and sewer works projects, and also the ones that we support. Uh, which are the three last uh, did that uh, you can see below. Um, so um, by this way, we are sort of uh, making a, a long list of, uh, I think it's now 33, the demands uh, that we set towards these uh, these targeted groups, uh, named mainly in, in, in terms of uh, environmental sustainability. Uh, so it's uh, sort of a life cycle analysis, uh, avoiding of uh, sort of, uh, hazardous uh, substances, uh, environmental uh, labeling, uh, goods, uh, uh, sustainable produced woods, uh, uh, material catalog of building, uh, sort of uh, making sure that the materials can be reused, uh, a circular, circular economy agenda. Um, the newest uh, thing uh, that came about in 2021 was to also uh, have buildings uh, labeled. So uh, buildings above 20 million Danish kroners, around 3 million euros in, 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 in uh, buildings, some uh, are, uh, are to be uh, DG and B certified. That's uh, a German certification scheme that has been made into Danish and which is the most widespread in Denmark uh, certification uh, scheme. So there we certify our own buildings to gold level and, and social housing up to silver uh, level. Um, and uh, besides this, we are sort of we have we have some bubbling, uh, wobbling demands uh, below the the the, uh, the fixed uh, sort of uh, demands, where we try to uh, to increase our focus on circular economy. Uh, we own around five percent of the building mass in the city, so these are some of the buildings that we own and where we try to do some circular economy uh, initiatives. Um, next steps is to focus a lot more on concrete and steel, which are the two biggest uh, emitters. Uh, and to have material passports uh, and, and so we can sort of follow the materials around and also to make some some um, uh, some places physical places where we can store uh, surplus uh, materials until we uh, need for them again therefore avoiding to to, to buy uh, new ones um, 
the initiative uh, I'll talk about next is uh, towards uh, non-road mobile machinery, uh, where we are trying to uh, to to get rid of the uh, the emissions from them. Uh, we we have a, a, a an emission budget of, of uh, four hundred thirty thousand tons per year. We we need to cut to zero, and uh, these number of mobile machineries uh, are estimated to have up to seventy five thousand tons a year. So uh, it's a big chunk uh, that we can that we can try to access by by uh, by, by having an initiative on on these machines. So therefore, uh, well, thereby, we also reach uh, the goal in our climate plan to reduce emissions from these machines to uh, by 30 to 40 percent before 2025. But we also uh, reach uh, a number of other good goals, namely to reduce noise uh, reduction um, or to have noise reductions from these machines also, and to 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 have more clean air in the city. And uh, besides this, this agenda also uh, it also really improves the conditions for workers and residentials and bypasses. Uh, you can see the benefits from these uh, machines here. Uh, you can see it below, below the figure, the, the one from fossil diesel, where you have all the disadvantages. Uh, we we sort of ask now for fossil and or emission free uh, machinery. Uh, and this is because we cannot uh, have uh, zero emission machinery in, in, in namely, uh, especially heavy machinery. Um, so we ask for, for sustainable produced biofuels and or emission free machinery. Um, but it's only only with the zero machinery, zero emission machinery, you can see all the benefits are sort of achieved. Uh, one big disadvantage in Denmark is the tax structure that, that makes uh, biofuels very much more expensive than fossil diesel around 1.5 euros, I would say, per liter with the, with the price and prices now. Now also some uh, disadvantages from using emission-free machinery. Uh, besides what I have said that heavy machinery is uh, hard to get uh, emission-free, then it's also, uh, you need to look at the, how, how to get uh, enough power uh, in, in the right time. So the logistics is also uh, an important thing. Uh, this is a private entrepreneur who's working for us, and uh, he has made uh, this uh, sort of mapping of, uh, of the, the, the noise and air pollution. And uh, in the, the left one, you can see an emission-free uh, road being refurbished uh, with emission-free machinery, and the right with a diesel. So you can see on the right and with a diesel machinery, it's only the smoke break that has the, the, the cut in the emissions. Whereas, uh, as opposed to the other one, you can see this morning is actually where the particle pollution comes because they were with the emission free machinery. So just to give uh, the other perspective besides the CO2 cuts. Um, in terms of this machinery, we work uh, with uh, in three steps our own fleet and then in, in construction and sewer wash projects. And then we try to also move the market. Uh, by having a, a collaborative uh, forum that we that we began in 2020, and to also engage in international projects. Um, in terms of our own fleet, uh, you cannot uh, you cannot look at this in detail more later, but it, but it has been uh, very uh, sort of easy to to have the road machinery, uh, the, the the cars, uh, the small vans, to to uh, emission free. Uh, but uh, we have have a, a way to go uh, in terms of non-road. Uh, we are between zero to 25% in, 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 in our change to electricity or hydrogen or gas. Um, we have very much made the case by studying Oslo, going to Oslo, having Oslo to come down to us. Uh, they have uh, been running with this agenda to, since 2015. And now it's a mandatory demand uh, that they only give points to to, to projects uh, that are that are made emission free. Uh, by following the example of Oslo, we were able to ask the politicians for money, and we were able to, to get money in our budget 2020. So three budgets ago, we have had money to 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 uh, change to sustainable biofuels in our own fleet and to make pilots in construction and sewer so projects. Um, and here you can see the, 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 the translation from the budget agreement also in 2022, where we sort of doubled the amount of money we had uh, from the politicians to, to work on this uh, agenda. Uh, actually, the, in several work projects, the, uh, the, uh, I would say the experiences uh, with the market uh, to respond to these uh, uh, demands, it, it is so that we ask for an optional price to have our projects done with fossil and or emission free machinery uh, besides the conventional solution. And then we can say yes or no to this uh, solution. 
but uh, the uh, market response was so good that we have had, had it as a mandatory demand from the of January 2021 to to this option of us. Uh, and this has made it uh, possible to have a lot more projects uh, done uh, this way than, than we otherwise uh, would have. Also because the price uh, tag uh, on this uh, it has been not so uh, so high actually. Uh, I'll take that to that. Um, um, so we ask for uh, for emission free machinery if if the machines are below two and a half tons in weight, and we also have the 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 the, the list of works that we know these machines can do. And so this is this is dynamic procurement demands uh, that needs needs to be moved over time to be ambitious but not too ambitious so that the market can follow. Um, in, uh, in in construction Copenhagen, it's called uh, where they do the schools, so institutions, uh, big renovations of buildings and so on. They work in a longer uh, time frame with the same uh, entrepreneur, and therefore they can do more collaborative work with with that uh, partner. Uh, and they have these five focus points where number of mobile machinery is also uh, one of them. Um, from our zero works projects, it's it's only uh, from from zero to three percent uh, of the construction sum. That the extra price tag is on, on this, uh, and I should say that that politicians in the, in Copenhagen and our city council have agreed to a, a uh, increase in price from eight to twelve percent to have the whole sustainability in construction and construction works package. So there is a willingness to pay in 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 the, in the city council to do these uh, kinds of uh, works um, uh, to to reach our climate goals. To also have innovation in the market towards more small green solutions, uh, so that of course uh, helps to have uh, politicians that are in favor of uh, trying to meet the climate emergency. Um, yeah, I'll go uh, besides this, and maybe you can also uh, skip this one. You can read it yourself and get back to me if you have questions. But our next steps is uh, is to focus a lot more on like, electricity. To, uh, to 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 have the projects done only uh, by using by the use of electricity. Um, what we do in terms of in terms of market, uh, our number three uh, is to to be a part of the big buyers network, uh, a European uh, initiative uh, run by ECLA, and we also participate as an innovative city in the C40 uh, migration. Even though we're not a big city, we are a, uh, sort of an innovative city, and therefore we can can join. Uh, the purpose is to, of course, uh, have knowledge sharing and make joint statements of demand uh, to have more people or more, more, more buyers asking for this so we can move them back. Uh, and, um, and we also have our own collaborative, collaborative forum, as I have uh, mentioned before, where we have uh, the whole sort of value chain represented, where we uh, four times a year meet, uh, virtual or uh, real person, uh, to, to discuss matters uh, of interest uh, to this uh, agenda. Um, this is just a slide that I've made to to sort of uh, make sort of uh, towards uh, the, the state and market uh, level uh, some good good points as to what could move this a lot further than we can ourselves as a municipality. Uh, last slide I think is this one. Uh, yes, uh, this, this is from the from the UN saying that. Uh, we are sort of sleepwalking working towards the destruction of the world, and we are trying to do our part of the work not to do so in, in the city uh, of Copenhagen. But I think it's uh, very much more important to go a lot faster than we do now uh, in, a, in a lot of areas. Uh, and I have found inspiration from the Council of Wales. I think it was that last year had this uh, climate emergency sign up, and then they said, hey, we stop all infrastructure projects, and then we screen by a need to nice to principle. Uh, and I think this can be the, the actual the actual consequence to do so if we don't have the, the emission free solutions uh, ready in time. So um, big thing in Denmark is coming up is absolute sustainability to focus on that uh, science based targets approach and uh, to 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 focus on that and uh, we have a big uh, sort of agenda on that uh, on the third 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 November uh, in, in Denmark where we have have the annual building green. Uh, Event uh, in Denmark. Uh, so uh, come in, uh, come hear that if you are interested. And uh, then I will uh, finish up with this uh, quick tour in uh, what we do in in, in yeah you know our city. Amazing! So, uh, Thank you very so much, Kais. Thank you, um, and well done again. Lots of slides to pack into to a few 
few minutes. Um, I really like that quote at the end, which uh, of there's nothing more dangerous than the illusion of progress, um, mm. uh, which is definitely something to live by. I think um, it sort of reflects something one of one of the strands of work my society has been doing is is sort of around that the importance of analysis and transparency of what local authorities are doing um and it's actually a nice segue into our, with a with a sort of data journalism perspective our fourth speaker ornaldo um uh take it away thank you zarino and uh, thank you uh, everyone for participating and uh, for organizing this terrific event so i will start sharing my screen without further ado okay i hope it's visible now and um, well i am ronaldo giardi and i work as a data journalist and uh, data analyst for uh, the european data journalist network and Osservatorio balcani caucaso trans europa which is a newsroom located in italy so uh, today i will mostly speak about a project that um, we did uh, a couple of years ago but uh, that it's still proving uh, uh how can i say uh worth sharing and uh, interesting when it comes to uh, innovation tech and uh, environmental data especially uh so what we tried to do uh was to uh, use open data uh, especially shared by uh, the European Union and the Copernicus project of the European Union to assess the impact of uh, global warming in, uh, let's say, uh, at the local level, especially at the level of municipalities or cities. So we managed to use this data to assess how uh, climate change and global warming uh, uh, hit differently uh, around 100,000 European cities <clears throat> across 30, uh, 35 countries uh, with a data availability that spanned from 1959 to 2018. Uh, the reason why, the main rationale why we decided to do something like this uh, stems from uh, a question which is uh, how can, uh, let's say, a normal a normal person, an average person who maybe doesn't know much about uh, climate change and global warming, identify with this phenomenon because, of course, global phenomenon uh, affect everyone around the world by, by definition, but it's difficult to empathize with the local repercussion that can happen uh around the places where we live our everyday life let's say and so we decided to use these uh data set like in this image you can see an exemplification of this data set uh, that consists it's of course abstract uh, uh being a climatological data set there is a very small uh cells in a grid uh, with every cell uh having an area of around 30 square kilometers uh, and for every cell we had uh, uh per day for measurements of the temperature across the uh, almost 70 years of data so we could do something really interesting which was assessing the differences in how climate change hit different cities uh, at the city level so also uh, let's say in the same country or within the same uh, region in a country there might be differences according to the cities and um what we wanted to do was to give the opportunity to everyone to look at their own place or the places they knew they know to see how the uh, impact of climate change has impacted. Um, we created a dashboard and this is a screen, but soon I will actually enter the dashboard so that uh, I can give a bit of the experience. And every dot in this dashboard is a city. And of course, given that our aim was uh, going uh, very wide at the European level, as you may see already from these, uh, there are differences country by countries in the density of uh, these dots of the cities, because for instance, France has uh, uh, several tens of thousands of municipalities, while the United Kingdom uh, far less, like you can see how sparse the dots are. This of course depends again by the data that are shared uh, um, by the European Union or in general by this European data set uh, and on how local administrative units uh, are intended country by country. And uh, of course, every country has different ways 
to uh, uh, let's say rationalize its uh, local governments uh, and so we had to uh, rely on these and what we wanted to do was to give uh, as I said the opportunity to the people who decided to look at this dashboard to see city by city what the impact had been uh, by looking for a city and uh, zooming uh, to in order to add this information so I will actually open this maybe it is better like this uh, for instance let's say um, as I had in the uh, in, in the slide let's say about Florence uh, let's say we want to zoom in the city and we have this card that is open with how uh, the difference has been calculated and we calculated the difference between the last decade of available data and the first decade of available data to assess what the change has been in those periods of time and per every city we have the possibility to actually look at how the change has been over time, uh, taking the first 10 years of data as a baseline and to see how, let's say, the uh, temperature has been behaving into um, in uh, between 1971 and 2018, the last year of available data. And we can, of course, see this Florence, but it's very similar for most of the city, that especially from the 90s, the temperature started raising quite a lot. And, um, Apparently, this is something that it's not going to change anytime soon, unfortunately. And uh, what we also wanted to do was to give a possibility to compare different cities and different regions and areas of uh, the world, uh, of Europe and uh, within the countries of the region. So, of course, Florence is in Tuscany and Tuscany has a uh, different uh, sub-regional uh, administrative units uh, besides Florence so uh, we could give all of these information because of the richness of the data that uh, we managed to find and to analyze and of course going from the region and to the nation to see what has been uh, for instance uh, the differences among these places and uh, another uh, thing just uh, since we are here to check on the United Kingdom for instance uh, we can see for instance here in london we have like the city of london which apparently have a, a temperature change of almost three degrees uh, uh in the from the last decade of available data and the first decade of available data and these uh let's say uh this, this work had the main intention to uh, do something that, of course, it's quite distant from crafting a policy or uh, having an actual change in, uh, uh, let's say, in the behavior of uh, the people in a certain municipality or in a certain area. It is mostly intended to create a critical mass around the issue so that uh, we can reach the highest number of people to uh, tell them, hey, uh, we know that global warming seems very abstract and very complex uh, as a topic to discuss, but uh, there are differences that uh, in your everyday life, given that climate change is happening and has already started happening quite a few uh, since the last decades, which is, for instance, that a difference of a very few degrees means that uh, uh, nowadays, uh, the behavior that you actually have uh, in a given season is different from it was a few decades ago because uh, it may make the difference uh, of, uh, I, don't, um, I don't know, like uh, having or not to take a jacket to go out because it's warmer and you don't have to. Or more specifically, for instance, uh, the snowfall, like in certain area, especially in Italy, like I'm from Italy, uh, in the Apennine region, there's not snow anymore and this uh, creates of course a lot of spill negative spillovers which is uh, damage to the local economy because you don't have that index anymore and um, we managed to create this dashboard mainly as a service uh, for other journalists and for other non-governmental organizations and through the last uh, couple of years actually we had quite uh, uh, a few very interesting outcomes uh, to start with uh, more than 100 local news stories on the changing climate have been written so that uh, we could uh, 
enable local journalists, especially which, which were our main target, uh, to talk about the impact of climate change in the local areas. Uh, this has been really interesting as a phenomenon because um, it is, uh, as I said in the beginning, very difficult to find, journalistically speaking, a frame that is interesting for local newspapers uh, uh, because they might have to rely to global data, but these then, uh, um, how can I say, it's uh, something that it's more interesting for maybe national media. And so the local media is often not talking much about that unless some emergency happened. Uh, we could find a high level of identification from the readers, uh, which is that looking at the comments, at these stories, or in general, the comments that the journalists share back to us from the readers, uh, uh, we had uh, a lot of people actually realizing uh, what it might or might not mean for them in their everyday life uh, in the in the city where they live their everyday life uh, what climate change meant uh, these data and this dashboard has also be has also been used as uh, one of the many means to support the stop global warming european citizen initiative which meant to collect enough signatures around the european union in order to uh, put a policy proposal on the table of members of European parliaments uh, to, uh, let's say, adopt a carbon tax legislation. And uh, it also uh, showed us and let's say the uh, community of data journalists in Europe uh, some potential for future works on the local dimension of climate change and um, this global phenomenon. Uh, but of course, in order to do that, uh, we will need more data, especially for local governments, uh, in order to have these fine grained analyses uh, and uh, let's say um, have a more uh, impact and have more impact at the local level. And uh, unfortunately, this data uh, at the local level is often lacking or patchy where he, uh, when he's there. This is a multifaceted problem, of course, because every country has its own way of uh, dealing with local data on how they are collected, how they are shared, if they are shared. So it's uh, really difficult uh, to have, let's say, a pan-European perspective of these on these. So mostly uh, it's going to uh, be something about national data, but again, within the same nation, different, municipal different municipalities or administrative units, uh, again, might uh, have differences on how the data is collected, how it's shared, if it's shared. And uh, so besides as uh, so besides using this kind of dashboard to talk about climate change and the local uh, impact of climate change uh, we also saw that working like this with very local uh, data of global phenomenon uh, can also be used in order to uh, let's say uh, push local government to share more data so that the journalistic community can write stories about that uh, and uh, civil society organization can create events and uh, eventually this uh, critical mass through the time, hopefully sooner rather than later, might be able to actually um, achieve some change and have the means to actually achieve these kind of changes. And uh, thank you very much. Amazing, thank you. Um, uh, I especially love a live demo. <laughs> As a product person, seeing a live demo and it all worked, it's great. But as Ariane said in, in the chat, it's so impactful seeing local data at that kind of global scale. Um, it's really encouraging and also frightening at the same time, which I think is a good mix. Um, finally, uh, there, I think there was a couple of questions in, in the chat as well, but we'll keep those for, for the end. Um, on to our third and final uh, international speaker, Casper. Um, uh, with some inspiration, perhaps, from how Amsterdam is facing climate challenges with Waternet and the Resilio project. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I will um, share the screen. It's visible uh, and yeah. tell you our story about the Resilio project um, uh, and a Euro European funded uh, Blue Green Roof project um but first i will step into the context in what in uh, which it was developed because that will give more um insight in uh, the results uh i'm casper span uh, and work at waternet the public 
uh, water organization for the municipality of Amsterdam and the local uh, regional water authority, Amsterdam Vecht, uh, working in the domain of climate adaptation for quite a while. Um, Uh, this story can't be told without mentioning the Amsterdam Rain Proof Program um, that started uh, in 2014. And it's um, a network based um, uh, program uh, focused on climate adaptation, especially extreme rainfall, but broadening since then, with the uh, implicit message that we as a government can't do it alone. Uh, working the climate adaptation challenge. And we have to involve uh, all stakeholders uh, to get action done. Uh, we focus on all those part, uh, yeah, stakeholders in the city, uh, from knowledge institutes to garden centers, uh, of course, our citizens, um, and create awareness, involvement, uh, work on perspective and get into action. Um, we've created a so-called boundary object, which means that the ownership of this platform and network is a shared um, responsibility. And it's not uh, publicly owned. It's not the water uh, organization that tells you what to do, but it uh, invite you to get involved. And that's a different um, point of view to take action on. Um, concerning our blue-green roof ambition started uh, a year earlier, parallel to the Rainproof uh, project. Uh, and it was, uh, well, a sort of pop-up project uh, started with uh, the duck doctors, the roof doctors. They want to make the city healthy, is their catchphrase. And they always ask me, when is a green roof blue? Uh, difficult uh, question, and we search for answers. And eventually, they came up with uh, a crate based a water storage system underneath uh, a classic uh, green roof layer. Uh, and in the end, we added um, uh, a valve system to create control. Uh, and that took us uh, a long way. So we went whole roof ward with that blue-green roof concept. Uh, and we learned that quantified water storage on, on private property is a possibility. And it can be dynamically managed, and that creates a whole new field of water management, micro water management. And that uh, learned us so much uh, on uh, the new perspectives we had to find on, on, on uh, governance issues, on how to finance this, how to get people involved to create the relevant market. Um, uh, but in fact, it was just combining. Uh, classic techniques, there's no rocket science behind it, but uh, uh, create a new um, system that uh, catches water and stores it on the roof. Um, we, in the Rainproof philosophy, we worked with a lot of other partners and started to uh, create a new community uh, roof involved partners to work on that blue challenge. And that eventually led to a lot of spin-off. Um, policy instruments, new insights, uh, the relationship between uh, heat stress cities and water evaporation as a cooling element, uh, the relation with biodiversity, uh, a biodiverse roof needs water uh, to uh, get through the droughts we are facing. So that's uh, so many connections that need to be uh, nourished and controlled. And that's why we call it an ecosystem approach. There isn't a direct road to create this new solution. No, it was um, a multitude of relationships we had to 
uh, work with, uh, with the challenges uh, had, um, and that learned us so much. And that created the background for the Resilio project. Also on the national scale, uh, as Amsterdam, we were one of the lead partners in the creation of the Green Deal Green Roofs, uh, the framework development for the multifunctional roof space and the follow up in the national roof plan. And that states that we should uh, embrace the roof landscape that's a bit barren still nowadays, but uh, offers us so much opportunity to find energy solutions, social solutions, the red color, uh, biodiversity uh, ambitions, the green, and of course, I'm a blue guy, uh, water management uh, possibilities. And in the connection, uh, we find uh, the solutions because uh, as stated many times, uh, every roof needs its own solution. There's a lot of made to measure work. Uh, and one of the outcomes of Resilio that's starting here, it's an ugly acronym, but uh, it works for Europe. Uh, we started in 2018, in fact, with uh, another failed um, Horizon 2020 proposition, recycled it. Uh, and worked it up to uh, a UIA uh, urban innovative action program, um, a different program than Horizon 2020. It focuses on a single city. It has a fat uh, coverage uh, of funds. 80% of the means were uh, brought in from Europe. Uh, and we combined it with the social housing corporations because we already learned that um, creating um, multifunctional roofs on new built uh, real estate is relative easy. We have you know, a lot of instruments already ready for that. Uh, but the existing city, uh, existing real estate is much more difficult. And that's where the social housing came into focus because they have uh, in Amsterdam uh, almost 50% of the real estate uh, in the city. The whole consortium uh, was made up with uh, 10 partners in the beginning, one stepped out. Uh, Waternet and Amsterdam were managing uh, the program. We had um, uh, the social housing free partners uh, in Amsterdam from the five main uh, social housing corporations in Amsterdam. We had, of course, researchers from the universities, the Free University and um, uh, Hogeschool. And of course, the market uh, partners who helped in the innovation and the realization of the blue green roofs. This is the infographic that, well, brings it to life um, and shows that um, uh, we wanted also to engage all the uh, renters and the citizen, uh, citizens about why we are doing this uh, and how they could uh, participate and uh, tell the storyline about uh, climate adaptation and the necessity. This is an overview of uh, part of the city where all the roofs were developed in green, uh, the social housing corporations, in orange, the uh, other uh, additional grant scheme uh, focused on more uh, private ownership uh, or combined private ownership uh, who could also apply for blue green roofs and two uh, innovation lab roofs where we were showcasing the possibilities uh, and learning with the uh, knowledge institutes uh, about their uh, possibilities. This is from a water management perspective, the, the big uh, learning and or the big innovation we brought to this uh, concept. And that's the decision support system uh, that can micromanage each uh, water storing object, the roofs, um, on an object-based um, uh, way, where we uh, use the macro level data uh, 
for instance, the weather forecast, of course, uh, location specifics, uh, water management data, and combine that with micro level information about storage capability, other water functions combined to the roof system, uh, more information about the demand of uh, the owners uh, on how they want to use the water. And in that way, we can create a squeezable sponge over the city that can be uh, can um, uh, retain water when extreme rainfall is expected uh, and falling and can store water when droughts are um, uh, expected and uh, uh, hold the water for the greening of the roof system. Well, since then we uh, disseminated uh, one of the tasks from Europe to, to tell that story, that the learnings that we did uh, and bring it further to Europe. That was why we were also, uh, um, uh, well, uh, said easily yes to your invitation to, to share our story over here. Um, because we feel that the, uh, the lessons we learned and the, the solutions that blue green roof systems with an active uh, micro water management capability can bring to urban areas uh, is a shared one. Some of the lessons learned because it was a project focused on scaling up and we are still working on it uh, further, but procurement and and well i'm not going to read them all but it's 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 still a, a developing market and it makes it sometimes difficult uh to find also the right business case business casing is also a bit uh awkward instrument uh for old guys who want to challenge innovation in my opinion um but the we see the opportunity uh, with these blue green roof systems all around our city and in cities uh, around Europe with uh, the note, not everything is possible on any roof, but on every roof, there are possibilities. How are we proceeding in Amsterdam? Well, we're now we're working on an integral roof plan in Amsterdam to, to work on, on how to um, work in that complex domain of roofs because as a public organization you can create a policy but you do not own the roof so you have a bit complex re um, uh, relation towards those uh, systems but they are essential to tackle public challenges in the city one of the uh, functions we're looking for is a roof director who can bring partners together and manage uh, roof expectations and ambitions um, in the city. Uh, we see that a new governance challenge is coming up, uh, the micro water management, where we as a public partner want to have influence control uh, on the private domain, and that's a challenge, so to say. Um, and uh, we're still very confident that it's a growing field. We see it being adapted uh, by other countries as well. Uh, a lot of interest around the world and also uh, growing awareness in, in, in other countries, Southeast Asia, North America, etc., to work with this concept. More information, I'm not going to name them all. Uh, the uh, presentation is shared with the organizers and they can share it with uh, the rest of the crew but this helps you to deepen uh, your uh, questions uh, and help you find answers or we can start the q a any moment thank you for your attention back to you serena thank you very much casper that's been really interesting um and almost bang on time, we're into the into questions. Um, I think uh, Klaus might have to leave early. So if Klaus is still online, I was gonna uh, maybe prioritize one question, one or two questions for him before he goes. Um, 
I guess that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, we had a, a question from Cormac in the chat. Um, could you tell us more about district heating in Copenhagen and how that could help decommission thousands of fossil fuel home heating systems? Mm, yeah, it is so that uh, it's, a, it's a company called uh, Hofor, H-O-F-O-R, that supplies the whole city of uh, Copenhagen with uh, district heating. It's, it's, it's uh, mainly owned by the city itself. Uh, and it, it covers 98% of the city is supplied with the district heating from this uh, company uh, used for uh, heating of uh, houses, uh, flats, uh, businesses, uh, uh, water for the bath and the, 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 the yeah, <clears throat> the water. It's, yeah, and the, the biggest, biggest part is, of it is produced uh, on, on big uh, plants. Uh, and what we burn is biomass um, and uh, garbage. And uh, a little part of it is natural gas. And, uh, and then a very much smaller proportion is, is by burning of oil. Uh, but it, that's only for, for peak, peak periods. <clears throat> But one of the critiques also from, from the climate plan has been in the burning of uh, biomass. Uh, I think it not only comes from Denmark, but also from the Baltic uh, countries, for instance. Uh, so this is not seen as a sustainable way forward. So we will find other ways to, uh, to have it made in the future. But of course, it's, it's, it's a lot more uh, environmental, good way to, to, to to supply heating uh, to, the, to the citizens than, uh, than uh, yeah, than oil, than uh, that, that is what the person is asking about also. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, there was uh, also another question, just a comment of, is there a link to the building material data um, that we could access that you that you mentioned? So uh, I don't know whether you've already... It's, it's uh, only in, in Danish. Uh... <laughs> So that's a shame for you guys, but then you should invite one of my colleagues uh, to, to, to talk about this. But but I can uh, just, uh, if I should share with you quickly, uh, then you can see yeah, yeah. Uh, what, it, what it looks like, because they actually uh, do a handbook that is uh, sort of revised uh, very often. And, and here you can just see the, 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 the chapter two, it's called the low hanging fruits. And there you can see it. So it's concrete CLT elements in in, in wood, and it's uh, I don't know what that is in English actually, but glass, glass wall, um, the light amateurs, uh, mineral wall, or bricks, uh, walls, uh, division walls, uh, steel, uh, uh, yeah, bricks and so on, and wood. <clears throat> And of course, the problem with uh, the whole circular economy uh, agenda is to uh, to have, uh, have 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 the materials in in a, in a clean in a clean way. So that's why we're developing material passports, uh, so that, that we can make sure what the fractions are and that they're clean and not polluted by 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 other, other things. But that's of course going into the whole circular economy agenda that has been uh, a thing since the cradle to cradle. Yeah, I think it was maybe my colleague Miff who asked a question in the chat about circular economy, like, could you give some examples of some of the sorts of materials or goods that can be reused and what the challenges are with that? Uh, I think it's uh, up to 100% uh, reused in, in our civil works projects. So it's, so it's uh, mainly the avoidance of, of, of buying new, uh, new granite uh, and instead of reusing the ones that we uh, sort of remove when we do uh, projects one place and use it in another place and then it's uh, what we do for, for for roads is to also use the concrete if it, if it cannot be re reused in other ways then, then it gets uh, sort of uh, grinded and then we can use it to to materials to to make new uh, roads and uh, yeah and then you saw the landfill site so if we cannot use the materials then we sort of uh, deposited locally in our North Harbor, and then we sort of uh, expand the city that way. And uh, one big uh, sort of also controversial project is called, uh, it's an island, uh, artificial island called uh, Lunetteholmen, where, because our soil deposit deposit is, is full, because we have so much new buildings and new metro and so on, so we have a lot of, of dirt <clears throat> and, uh, and soil, clean and dirt, dirty soil uh, all, all the time. So the new project is to make a bigger island outside of Copenhagen. Um, 
and uh, that's kind of controversial because it's a big, big uh, infrastructure project. project. Uh, yeah, so kind of blocking the way, blocking the harbor. So, but it's also seen as a climate adaptation project, but it could be solved in, in, in a less, less way, I would say. I think um, a topic that came up in maybe a couple of the comments earlier, and it maybe it sort of applies to all of the speakers who, who are left here, um, is like the idea of what the local authority or the local council is able to do and the sort of what the national government is doing or how much support it's giving. I wondered, what does that look like internationally? So maybe, maybe Klaus, as, as you were already speaking, maybe we just go with you and then go over to maybe Casper for the for his perspective like here in the UK there's there's often a lot of but the national government isn't supporting the local councils to do this kind of work like is is that is is there pushback like that in Copenhagen as well um does yeah. does it feel like the 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 city level and the national level are aligned and supporting each other or is is it more difficult uh, in, in, the, in the Copenhagen context, it, it's it's more difficult. Uh, we we uh, sort of have to give a lot of our money away to to smaller municipalities around around uh, Denmark uh, because we are so so uh, such a, such a big uh, municipality, and, uh, and that has been a lot of talk. Also, uh, that can be backed up uh, by by actions that that the government in Denmark is not actually supporting. Uh, big cities uh, in in Denmark, uh, like Copenhagen, for instance, uh, and instead of sort of favoring the, the provincial uh, part of uh, Denmark, so that's been a very big critique. Even though the Lord Mayor in in in, the, in our city is a social democrat and the government is a social democrat, then then they know that there are more more voters in the, in the country uh, regions of Denmark than in the than the, in the capital. So we have to finance a lot ourselves, but it's 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 clear that. For instance, in the agenda of non robot machinery, uh, a lot of things could could happen much quicker if the uh, government, uh, governments on state level, EU level, were, were on this agenda and wanted to do something. Then they could do a lot more than we could ourselves. Casper, um, is it similar in Amsterdam? Um, well, I focus especially on climate adaptation and uh, also uh, we have a national program uh, on climate adaptation and that's speeding up and now already working for more than uh, than eight years now um, but uh, a lot of the measures eventually have to ground uh, at the local level uh, and uh, even on the, the well the, the small stamp that the netherlands is we see uh, large differences between the eastern and the western part uh, the hilly south uh, and the low-lying uh, well uh, delta based uh, western uh, part so it's a search because you have to find the right measures on the right scale uh, and that's in such a new developing policy uh, domain as climate adaptation, uh, still a search, uh, often who's going to pay and what's it going to cost us and who's going, uh, who's own, who owns the challenge. But we think that as a capital uh, city, uh, Amsterdam, we have, um, uh, uh, we need to have that ambition and share it with uh, our uh, fellow uh, communities uh, and municipalities. We have long-standing relationship also with Rotterdam and, and the other big cities in the Netherlands, so we don't do it alone. But um, sometimes being ahead is nice, but don't be, uh, well, uh, angry at the others if they jump over you and our head in another field. And in that way, you can stimulate each other, learn from each other, uh, and also work uh, the national government. We need sometimes more national uh, policy instruments than a multitude of local uh, policy um, uh, instruments. Um, I was I was going to say Annie. Obviously, uh, this is this is something that comes up in the um, school cars discussions a lot. Um, 
I wondered whether you had a perspective on on that kind of relationship between local authorities and national government and, and whether that's going to factor into the scorecards work coming up. Like I think this was a question that Cara put in the chat that will government's climate action be scored as a as a blocker for local authorities climate action maybe? Yeah, so I think it's very similar to what I was saying throughout the scorecards, um, my presentation in that Councils in the UK are limited to some extent by national government legislation. Uh, perhaps a good example is like onshore wind turbines. It's really hard to build them unless it's already like recognised in your local plan and in general national government aren't super in favour of them. However, there are things that councils can be doing within those current um, constraints. So to give some examples, and this is in terms of actions rather than plans, like councils can implement a workplace car parking levy to like raise income and reduce car parking. Nottingham so far as any council has done that. Councils can put in low emission zones and they can require new builds to have high energy efficiency standards. Although that one is interesting because we were researching it about trying to understand exactly what councils can do. And basically like the UK parliament has said like, it's unclear what councils can do. And I think there's just a lot of, yeah, it's not very clear and councils are kind of nervous understandably but like how far they can push the boat and because there's not that guidance or support a lot of places like Lancaster they're like changing their local plans their local government strategy on how they're going to build and support the area you know they're waiting for one council to do it first and then that sets a precedence for maybe other councils to do it so hopefully these scorecards will show you know, a better picture of what is already happening. And maybe there are some councils kind of like reaching that threshold in some actions that other councils aren't aware of and that might give them that confidence to do that work. In terms of how we're going to use the scorecards to like lobby for national government change, we're hoping that we can have like a research partner and like provide that um, knowledge and those recommendations of what can change at a national level. But also we want to make sure that our scorecard questions are most useful for campaigners and organisations within the sector. So Green Building Council are already working to kind of campaign for better planning regulation for climate related stuff, for local councils. So we want our questions to be useful for them so they can then use that data as further evidence, you know, to do the work that they're already doing. So hopefully that sort of answers your question. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, uh, Cara noting in the chat that um, National planning is a big barrier and road construction. Um, I, I wonder, Ariane, is this a challenge you faced at Wiltshire too? Yeah, definitely. I completely agree with everything Annie's just said, that it would be much easier for councils to do more if there were more um, sort of national policy uh, enabling, uh, you know, legislation and policy in place um, the national policy planning policy framework doesn't make it easy for councils to push and do more than kind of what's already in there um, as Annie says it's kind of you know up to individual councils to kind of test how far they can go um, while risking having a whole local plan thrown out if if um, it doesn't work, which costs an absolute fortune. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's there's something wrong in terms of how things are uh, nationally to enable local action. It's something that we are very active in terms of campaigning at, um, at a national level as local councils. So Wiltshire Council is a member of a lot of different organisations that all campaign. So we're, we're members of ADEPT, we're members of the UK 100. In fact, our leader is co-chair of UK 100, we're members of the Countryside Climate Network and through, all, and through the, the LGA as well, the Local Government Association. So through all those networks, we're campaigning really hard to say to national government, look, there are some things that we really need you to do to enable us to go further and faster. So, yeah, that's a key message. Yeah, campaigning. I'd, I was going to I was going to say, like, is there are there any good examples of either citizens or community groups or like. Like the wildlife trusts, for example, or whatever it was you mentioned, like or the, the local authority like working together to try and change this and to, to demonstrate like this is what we need at a local level from national government? 
I think what tends to happen is people tend to come to the council because we are the democratically, uh, uh, well, not me personally, but our councillors are the democratically elected representatives for Wiltshire and are the most accessible um, for people locally in Wiltshire who want to campaign. So they tend to campaign for the council to change things and actually a lot of the things that they want the council to change, some of the things we can change, but a lot of them um, are either very difficult for us to do because of the national context or um, you know actually in some cases actually just not possible for us to do so we then have to take those issues and campaign uh, join forces with other councils and campaign through those groups that I just mentioned um, and we do have a very clear set of requests from government so there was a uh, um, a blueprint document uh, which was put together through ADEPT and Ashton, Friends of the Earth, and a lot of councils signed up to that, including Wiltshire Council, and we said these are the things we need government to change. It's very, very clear, and it, unfortunately it hasn't changed very much because there hasn't been a lot done since that was launched, and it's just about to be refreshed. So anyone who wants to see what councils are actually asking for national government to change, you can, you can look up that document. Um, we had a, another question, one for Casper um, from Snoot Green. How would you recommend supporting renters or tenants to engage with their landlords or property owners to make these kinds of changes and installations? Have you found any mechanisms that work for that? Um, well, we believe... How did you do it? <laughs> yeah, we believe in, in, in starting the dialogue. Uh, and within the rainproof network, we also engage um, uh, commercial uh, real estate owners. Uh, their uh, driver might be that the creation of uh, a climate uh, adaptive building or climate robust building uh, has more value. Uh, a green building, uh, a more biodiverse building also has a higher value. In the social housing environment, uh, costs are a serious issue. Uh, in the Netherlands, they uh, don't have that much left to create that social housing necessary. Um, but in uh, mid-range or uh, high-end uh, real estate, we see easily uh, uh, adaptation towards multifunctional roof system because a roof terrace uh, or uh, a roof park-like landscape uh, can add value to real estate. We see um, transformations where uh, a communal roof garden with a little extra in the rent is easily embraced by the renters because they have a, a great view of surroundings, no worry about the garden as still a very nice place to uh to live the city that's really interesting yeah um and the sort of uh the kind of benefits i saw uh sean sharing in the chat the um in wales the situation with the well-being of future generations act that kind of adds similarly like looking at the other benefits of these kinds of things like rather than just reducing emissions or or whatever like are there well-being benefits that could be had or as you say like are there is there val financial value that, <laughs> that could be added to places by making these kind of changes yeah you have to find your local dialogue uh, yeah. sometimes uh, don't throw all the real estate owners uh, on one pile because some are ahead are willing to invest and and searching for and others are very reluctant and 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 keep their money and investments uh, down to the to the to the minimum um but in the cultural context everybody knows best locally uh, and uh, as suggested, uh, each region, each country has its own uh, legislation, its own goals, and find the right uh, language and, and the right triggers to uh, start a dialogue. And then you can go a long way. And uh, don't give up. That's the, uh, the main lesson, I guess, uh, yeah. because keep that dialogue going show the examples, work with each other, and then you will find progress. 
I think um, on the on the topic of dialogue, I know a couple of the comments uh, throughout the presentations were about this, the issue of um, uh, sort of involving residents, uh, representing opinions and views and lived experience from communities. Um, I think there was one uh, question for Ariane, maybe. Um, we'd love to know a bit more about the logistics of reaching more diverse respondents. Um, how do you go that extra mile to ensure they participate? Yeah, I'm happy to sort of say a bit more about that. I mean, I think the, there are sort of three elements to that. So one is about the channels that you use. So are they the channels that, you know, diverse communities are going to be engaging with? Um, another aspect of that, another aspect would be around using intermediaries. So having strong partnerships with people who can then reach out to those groups that the council can't reach on its own. Um, and then I think the other thing is around keeping things simple and accessible. So I showed the example of our easy read um, summary. Um, we also just produced, as I say, a very visual document, very engaging. Um, and then uh, just sort of examples of the channels that we use. I did sort of mention this um, in my presentation, but a mixture of online versus face to face versus posters and print so that you're you're sort of reaching people who are not um, necessarily, you know, uh, online um, and are not engaging with with social media, for example. Um, and then using intermediaries is, is really important. So there's like a, a Wiltshire Association of Local Councils, which will reach out to all town and parish councils, for example. There's the Wiltshire Racial Equality Council. There's a Centre for Independent Living to reach people with disabilities. So we have all these different intermediaries. We worked um, with the diocese um, to reach schools because they had an open door with certain schools who were very keen to work with them. Um, on our consultation so so we kind of went through them as an intermediary so we have you know all those partnerships and we use those partnerships then to have a way in with um, uh, partners that may have been more difficult or residents may be more difficult to reach otherwise um maybe annie you might have examples of uh councils potentially using technology or maybe old fashioned technology, like just getting out there and actually pounding the pavements and knocking on doors for this kind of local climate action, maybe around engagement. Are there any good examples of councils doing this really well or how they do it? Yeah, so I don't have like loads off the top of my head, but um, when they were writing the climate action plans, like decent citizens assemblies were often um, encouraged where um, you get a cross section of society to come and as they're giving up their time as volunteers, you then offer them, you know, payment or vouchers or at least travel expenses for the day, because that is often a big barrier to people attending and childcare like that. Um, we do want to see councils that have like ongoing engagement with residents um that isn't yeah just like Ariane said the like normal groups that you know care about the environment um and there have been some councils that have set up like online platforms where you can kind of like log in and share your comments and stuff like that can be great but um one of the things we're noticing is like we're not going to say that's like an ongoing way to engage with residents if it is like just sending in comments we want it to be interactive so people can respond to the comments you can see how many people there are so some are using um yeah actually more engaging things and some are less engaging i'm pretty sure for memories lambda is one of the more um, engaging ones and i do think yeah it is the strength the ability of councils to engage with like wider society where they are is like somewhat dependent on those councillors themselves and that culture and if those councillors you know really are members of the community and it like know about their local area you know like Arian said having connectors then it will be a lot easier so I think yeah it's this, it's a symptom of like perhaps like how the wider council is working it's not just about climate it's about more widely how a council like engage with, engages with its residents. Ariane, I think you had a, a comment to add. Yeah, I was just uh, responding to your comment about uh, door knocking. So that's not something we would normally endorse as a council because there are so many issues with cold calling and scams. 
and um, it's just not something that we normally do. So we would try to get the message out and encourage people to come to us at something local. So that's why we went for libraries um, so that people could come to their local library and talk to us. We also had copies of our climate strategy consultation document and easy read um, on all our mobile libraries. So we have, as well as all the fixed libraries in Wiltshire, we also have a van that goes around all the villages and we had all, you know, the poster and all that information on our mobile library. So that would have reached the rural communities, um, you know, close to their home without us actually going, going to knock on their door. Yeah, really good point. Um, Susan in the chat has shared that uh, in her breakout room this afternoon, she's going to be sharing how they used Vocalize, uh, which is an online platform to um, uh, engage the community in South Wales. Um, Klaus, I think maybe you had another point on this. Uh, comments, uh, one, one positive and two negatives uh, from Denmark about uh, citizen engagement in this, uh, in this agenda. Uh, one positive uh, done the in, end of last year, this uh, this year is, is from the municipality of Greve in, in Denmark, south of Copenhagen. We have uh, done what is called a climate citizen assembly, where you sort of uh, make a, people being represented by by sort of a, uh, it's, a it's sort of a digital thing to, to sort of a, Getting, making sure that you you get a representative uh, sort of portion of, of the, the citizens in Greve to to sit around the table and then uh, come up with uh, they are sort of presented towards uh, the agenda. Okay, we have uh, climate issues we need to tackle them. What 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 do you suggest? And then they come up with suggestions. And because the politicians were not so far, and because they were willing to sort of engage and listen to them, uh, this has been very a very successful example of uh, uh, this climate citizen assembly. We have also have had two nationals in Denmark, and they are both being being sort of analyzed negatively uh, by a man who has done so. Uh, because there has not been been the same uh, willingness to 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 listen to what the citizens had to say to to uh, to to to, yeah, to, to uh, not very many politicians uh, showed up and and uh, they wanted to do what they wanted to do themselves anyway and not listen to too much to the citizens but it, they have been analyzed by a guy called Lars Turner who is an expert in Denmark about this he's written a very interesting uh, book called Power in the Anthropocene uh, where he sort of makes the argument that that power uh, is sort of is sort of changing in light of uh, climate change. So uh, yeah, just an idea to contact him. That's really really interesting. We've got um, a couple of minutes left of the the Q and A, and then I'll uh, make sure everybody gets a lunch break. Um, I, I mentioned that we had these these grants available um, for for people to make use of, um, and we'll, we'll talk a bit more about those in the afternoon. I just wondered while we've got the speakers here, like if if you could implement something or a community you know or your local communities could implement something with five thousand pounds it's not a huge amount of money but maybe it's enough to test out an idea or make some small change to to prove something might work or like what what would it be what would what would you do with five thousand pounds um i don't know who wants to go first on that maybe uh pop your hand up if if you've got an idea go on Annie uh, definitely maybe not like my top it's just what came to mind yeah but, um but a lot of what councils are needing to do is to do that planning and the prep so it sounds like they've done it at Wiltshire but you know working out you know employing someone to actually cost how much would it cost to retrofit all homes um and how would we do it and like having that plan ready so that it can be used and a slightly lower scale one because some councils are doing it well and they should like legally they're able to um is enforcing minimum energy efficiency standards so having a landlord register of knowing all your landlords um so yeah basically consultancy work to work out who are the rented properties in the uk and what are their epc ratings so that councils then target ones that are illegal because they're below um epc rating e um and yeah, there is enforcement roles of councils but it it's doing that groundwork to understand that data so that work can then be um, implemented. They're the top things that come to mind because I've been looking at our building sections recently. <laughs> um, 
any other ideas from the other speakers? I see Cormac's got his hand up. I'll, I'll pass to him if, uh, if we haven't got anything else from the speakers. Go, go for it, Cormac. Welcome to the stage. <laughs> Or not? Sorry, I'm on, oh, I, yeah. I, I'm on speaker. Uh, one of the ideas I'd like to have is to have educational street parties. So in a local community, we put on street parties. And as part of the party, we educate people on, uh, say, solar power or district heating and uh, electric car uh, shared mobility um, and all that kind of thing that uh, people are just simply not aware of. I think, funnily enough, here in, I'm based in Liverpool, funnily enough, the road, one of the main roads in the city is getting closed tomorrow because it's car-free day or something, national. Yeah, it's car-free day, yeah. Right, yeah. And International. They're doing yeah. exactly that. There's like going to be a sort of impromptu fair on in, in the road space, uh, which I'm sure is going to frustrate a lot of motorists, but it could also be like a nice opportunity to share some new ideas yeah all, all, all the shared bike schemes here are given free bikes for the day so right that's great so we're we're having something similar but um the, uh, just more community education i think would would help uh, uh, localized education mm. um, would help um, and not just on a national level and um, because Unfortunately, the average person really just um, is too busy worried about their energy bills that they're not thinking about uh, what is actually available to them and how it would benefit them in the long run. Yeah. Um, Klaus, I saw you you unmuting. Did you want yeah, to? Yeah, one comment was that we the last time we had a car free uh, Sundays in Denmark was in the 70s where we had the energy crisis and, and it, it is being discussed again, but not in a serious matter. But uh, that could be a good idea also to, to implement uh, with us. I would just say, in, in terms of this uh, education for sustainable development ESD, uh, a big report has been just uh, given over to the Danish minister. Uh, in charge of this uh, by all the, the, the sort of the green organizations in Denmark. So that, that, that is a big uh, thing. Also, I would uh, like to uh, give my uh, props to that. But uh, what I would use uh, 5,000 uh, for was in, in my uh, local apartment where I live with, with 20 other apartments. Uh, so it's just to go ahead and use the money on direct implementation. Uh, to to make uh, our flat uh, flats more energy sustainable, uh, I think that George Monbiot he has shown in the book uh, Heat how to stop global warming is to just we can we know uh, what we can do. Uh, it's just to do it. So we should just get on the way with the five thousand and then to make a plan on how to implement the rest. Mm. Um, we know it, it, the only thing we need to we cannot do in the future is to fly. Otherwise, we can reduce to zero in all our ways if we want to. It's just having the will. Brilliant. Um, uh, fine, maybe a, a final comment from Sean. I just wanted to build on Cormac's point because I love the idea. I don't know if people are aware that San Francisco will pay for their residents to have street parties on the basis that it's the best way to prepare for a range of natural disasters that are kind of increasingly frequent in California. So rather than trying to retrofit a building to be better prepared for an earthquake at the same time as trying to figure out how you you know prepare for fires, you just want to get people to, to get to know each other better. So in the process of organizing a street party, the condition is that everybody's invited. So you find out whether you know, what languages people speak, uh, whether people have um, mobility impairments that you need to take into consideration. So if a disaster strikes, people know um, each other and know each are aware of each other's needs. So I just love it as a really lateral idea that it wouldn't be the thing you'd necessarily think of from a technical fix point of view. But so many of these solutions really, I think, boil down to uh, relationships. And, you know, I think that's where we see the link between democracy and climate being very strong. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and thank you so much to all of our speakers and to everyone who posted questions. I think there was a few we didn't manage to get round to, um, but uh, maybe the um, we can follow up by those um, by email afterwards. We're going to be... Um, writing a, a few blog posts about um, what happened on in this event and, and trying to summarize some of the, all of your amazing points. So thank you very much to our uh, speakers for this morning. Um,
you're all obviously welcome to stick around after um, after lunch uh, or whatever it is in your parts of the world. Um, and this afternoon, here's a quick summary of roughly what we'll be doing this afternoon. Um, so I'll I'll give a quick introduction to um, what's going to be happening after lunch. The two first two breakouts on adaptation and engagement. Then we're going to have a short break, and then two more breakouts on spatial planning and equity, diversity, diversity and inclusion. And then maybe a wrap up and some some next steps um, around, as I say, those um, grants or other ways we can try and support some some action uh, in local communities around around the UK and maybe beyond. Um, so uh, I think that that draws our morning to a close. Thank you so much. Um, we'll be back uh, in a new Zoom room. Uh, the links should all be in your Eventbrite and your emails. Um, and we'll see you at uh, two o'clock this afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thanks, all. Hi. Bye for now. Thank you.